Welcome everyone to The Money Show. And in today's discussion, we're going to look at the important question, is buy to let dead? I'm lucky to be joined by four eminent experts within the buy to let industry. Arya Tawa of Future Bricks, Shiv Haria of Lifestyle Properties, Hamza Anjmal of Ferguson Maidment & Co, and Abhishek Sahay of the State Bank of India. What I'd like to do is ask each of them to introduce themselves and how they, what their experience of buy to let is. Arya. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Arya Taure, I'm founder and CEO of Future Bricks, which is basically a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform for uh, property development projects, where small and medium-sized house builders are looking for funding and at the same time, retail investors can invest in these projects and get up to 10% gross interest per annum. Uh, so it's an investment product that, that we do, uh, different from buy to let uh, but we also have a class of investors, uh, you know, where we have, ex they have experienced buy to let product, but also experience this debt-based product. So my agenda is to kind of add a different perspective to the table today. Fantastic. Then that'd be very interesting to explore in the, later on. Um, Shiv. Hey guys. Uh... Thanks for having me on today. Uh, my name is Shiv Haria. Uh, I started investing in buy-to-let properties about uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, it was a necessity uh, that came with the position that I was in, which hopefully I'll explain later. And uh, right now we uh, have an offering where we help people who are typically based in London to invest their money in the northern property market, specifically at the moment in Yorkshire and in Leeds. Fantastic, Shiv. That's great. Um, Hamza. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Hamza. I'm tax manager at Ferguson Mailman. So I specialize in tax compliance and tax advisory for our UK based clients and international based clients. On top of that, we advise clients on restructuring and so forth for the property sector. Fantastic. I think we'll be asking you quite a few questions in this area. It's a hot topic tax. Um, Abhishek. Uh, thanks for having me, Tushar. We, uh, State Bank of India has been doing buy to let lending for about 10 years now. But over the last three years, it has become a big focus area for us. And it, it is a segment that we have identified as a growth opportunity. While, while your question is about whether buy to let is dead, we, we see that as a growth opportunity. And I, I head up the lending business for SBN. So happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Great. Uh, myself, I'm Tusha Shah, and I'm from Centrum Group. I'm a co-founder and director. We run multiple businesses, of which one of them is a buy-to-let portfolio, uh, predominantly in Reading and Birmingham, as well as a development company, Blenheim and Chester Developments. So look, we know that buy-to-let property has been a fantastic investment for centuries upon centuries. But in 2015, George Osborne, the chancellor, created some wide ranging changes that changed the landscape of property investment. First of all, they started taxing buy to let landlords on their income rather than their profits. We saw an increase in stamp duty, a 3% surcharge. We saw allowances such as the 10% capital allowances deduction on income to be removed. And we see increased regulation from gas certificates, electrical certificates, fire safety, and in the latest pandemic, we've seen evictions being stopped um, during this pandemic. My question is with all of these challenges and a simple question to the panel, is buy to let dead? And I'll start with Shiv, what would you think? Uh, so I think that um, there's lots of um, investment options available as everyone knows. And I think that one of the most well-known investment options is property. And certainly amongst the Asian community, you know, we have this um, desire to um, frankly own stuff. Um, and um, a lot of people that I speak to like to know that they can go and touch their investment rather than it's just, you know, some piece of paper or some numbers on the screen. They can actually go and uh, touch it. So tangible asset that um, uh, investment, I think, is what people are uh, looking for. So from a perspective of um, is it dead whilst it's ever changing as in any other market I, I think it's far from dead and I think it um, constitutes quite a large uh, fraction of people's uh, savings. Fantastic thanks Shiv and Abhishek from the State Bank of India do you find there's an appetite for buy to lets? 
Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what 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 has happened with respect to our book? Let's say with respect to Vitalnet, we've grown three times in the last three years. So that's that's where that speaks volumes about our appetite, but also in terms of the demand for the product in the market. That that remains very much alive. As in, it reminds me of that Mark Twain's situation where he had to write saying the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. No. I think. Um... Uh, it also reminds me of another quote that the best time to buy property was 10 years ago. The second best time is now. So I think that's a very good uh, uh, perspective to have. Tishar, that's one of the quotes that I always say to people, but actually I always say to people, it's best time to buy property was 20 years ago. Because if you had bought it 20 years ago, it'd be even better than 10 years ago. Exactly. No, you're right. It's definitely, I think that's the one thing. And it's a long-term investment rather than a short-term investment. Yeah. But Arya, you're in a very niche area, but a very growing area. Do you see buy to let being a dead, dead, dead economy or a growing economy? Um, I, 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 I wouldn't say it's dead, definitely. As um, Shiv mentioned that, you know, we, we, our community is basically obsessed with owning something, right? But I think there are more options in the market available now, especially with the advent of, you know, fintech companies and B2B lending where people can still get 10% you know, gross interest per annum, which is asset back, but it's a pure debt product. So it's just a different kind of a product that's out there in the market. Like traditionally, you know, as you mentioned correctly, you know, buy to let was a very attractive asset class and with the cha changes after you know, Chancellor. Uh, it's, it's becoming less attractive to some class of investors, but it's still gonna be attractive because it's bricks and mortar. But I think what is important to understand is that depending on what kind of investor you are, you know, because it does, it, it, it can consume time. At the end of the day, you are also owning the asset. So there is, you know, wear and tear allowance, which used to be there, which is no longer there anymore. And obviously changes in if you own a property as an individual versus company, you know, there are significantly different rules that apply. And depending on where you're buying as well, you know, so probably in the North, it's still very attractive you know, which is, you know, where, where Shiv is operating. But if you look at London, then, you know, you have to choose between rental yield versus capital appreciation. So uh, I think uh, it's not dead for sure, but I think uh, definitely diversification is important. And even with our product, like, you know, capital is at risk and it's not covered by financial compensation scheme. So to have a diversification in mind and what kind of investor you are and what kind of asset class you know, would, would you like to go for? So there, there's a lot to consider and buy to let. Yeah, no, and I think you made some very good points there. And I think the first thing that everyone should recognize is what type of investor you are. Are you a new investor? Are you an experienced investor? Actually, what is more important? Is it income or capital growth? And I think when you look at all of these, converse, these criteria, you start developing a picture of what type of investment really works for you. So I think there's some really good points there. And Hamza, I'm leaving you to the last, but you're going to give me the best answers, I know. And, and, I, and I think, you know, being an accountant is, from your experience, are you seeing buy to let a market where people are actually moving away from, or are you seeing more and more people having an appetite for buy to let? No, I mean, from a tax and accounting point of view, we're seeing more and more clients investing into buy to let properties, investing into commercial properties. Because we've seen that a lot of clients have purchased property from previous generations, which now all these assets are passed on to the next generation, and they have bigger ideas in terms of in terms of single construction companies, development companies, and just owning a variety of businesses basically. So it's getting a lot more complex because there's not only inheritance tax, income tax, capital gains tax, and yes, there's more restriction, but we feel that the appetite is still strong. So that's where we kind of come in. We kind of advise clients of how they can save taxes and so forth, where they pay the least amount of tax, but still achieve their business goals and objectives that they want to achieve, basically. Fantastic. And my question to you, and I get asked this a lot of time, and I see a lot of, lot of it on the forums. If I'm buying a property now, should I buy it in my personal name or should I buy it in a limited company? What's your professional view on this? So it's not as a simple question like that, because what normally happens, what we do, we take like a universal approach. So we'll ask you type of questions, what other type of assets do you own? Are you, do you have investment income? Do you have employment income? Do you have offshore income? 
and so forth. And the other type of question we also ask is, for example, do you want to own this asset individually? What's the long-term goal? Do you want to pass this asset to the next generation? So it's not as simple as own it under your own name, because technically you could own it under your own name, you could own it as a partnership, you could own it as a limited company. There is a ton of different combinations that you have, but what we find is not just you come to us once and that's the ultimate solution. Over your lifetime, generally what happens, your income increases, your tax structure will change based on your needs. So it's not always about tax savings. Maybe 10 years down the line, you might say, you know what, I want to save inheritance tax. So then it will be a completely different tax structure. 10 years, fast forward again, I want to save income tax, different type of structure. And of course, we live in a world now where the government is getting more aggressive. They want to save more tax. So what the best setup is now might not be the best in two years time. So we're always looking forward and advising clients on how to set up. Yeah, no, that's, it. that's a good piece of advice. And I think it comes back to the original question, identifying what type of investor you are, mm. getting the right tax advice based on that, and then reviewing it every three to five years because your circumstances and your incomes will change. Um, so definitely some good advice there. To so, add to that point, yeah. basically like, you know, like with the new products, especially like P2, whether it's a cash ISA or IFISA, that's something that's been introduced in this market. So that's also probably worth considering, you know, if you're looking for a uh, double digit interest yield with tax saving of, you know, 20,000 per tax year. So that's, that's, that's something that you can take advantage of. Yeah, no, fantastic. And I, I think that's something that let, let, let's explore this because um, many people think about buy to let is I buy a nice two bedroom new development flat uh, down the road from me because it looks nice. The kitchen's there. The tenant's going to look after it. But there are so many ways that you can make um, income and money from buy to let. So what um, Aria just talked about is actually through your ISAs, you can actually invest in peer to peer lending, um, which then invest in property deals and you can earn interest rates between eight to 10 percent. Um, and your company, Future Bricks, is one company within that area that does that. Um, one of my best deals was actually funded by a peer-to-peer -peer group, um, Crowd Property, uh, back in 2015. And it was a fantastic deal that allowed me to acquire a property within two months um, and then do the conversions and then pull all my money back and give the investors their money back and have a cash flow property there. So that's fantastic. So I think even though you might have just £5,000, you may feel that you don't have enough to get into property, but there are investments and there are risks as well. So you do need to do your due diligence, but you can make a good return of 8 to 10% on investments with companies like Future Bricks. So coming on to SHIB, you've got a very interesting um, uh, solution for busy professionals. Um, buying properties in Leeds um, up in the north. Why would I want to buy a property hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where I live? It's a great question. It's the first question that I get asked by most of the clients that come to us. And uh, as um, Aria mentioned, it's everyone sort of is starting to get an understanding now that the um, yields and the returns in the north are better. And typically, in the, what it's always been is um, if you want a, a better yield, go to the north. And if you want a better capital growth, come to the, come to the south. But I think a lot of that is turning on its head. And we can see that in um, all the stuff that's been happening as a result of the pandemic and how that's um, shifted um, the, the situations of a lot of people. So the first thing that we'll see is a lot of people are, are thinking to themselves, actually, do I need to live where I'm living within London? You know, can I move a little bit further out so that I have a bit more space? And if you come outside of London, you'll find that there's lots of places that have lots of space. Um, you've got uh, London's the largest city in the, in the UK, then you've got uh, Birmingham, then Manchester, and then Leeds. And a lot of people will know about these sort of larger cities. I think that there's um, the, the smaller the city, the uh, typically the higher the return that you can get. But then also the flip side is that's the rental return that I'm talking about. On the capital side, you, much, you have a, a much longer period to wait to get that capital return. So Leeds is in that place right now, which I suppose Manchester is in a similar place, where you're getting good returns and you're also getting good capital appreciation as well. And then obviously what you want to be looking at is this over a sort of a 10 year or 20 year uh, period. So the answer to your question of why do people come and say, why do we want to look at um, properties in the north? Ultimately, it comes down to number one, you get better returns. 
Number two, because it's an investment and you're not going to be kind of um, checking up on it every day, you have to put systems, because it's so far away, you have to put systems in place to manage the process for you. So you're not actually getting involved on a day-to-day -day basis. As well as that, you're not going to be emotionally driven because you can't go up and see that property every single day. If it was next door to you and you're feeling that pain and you're seeing the property, you've got to do something about it. You're getting emotionally involved making the decisions. The best investment decisions are made when you're emotionally attached and the way that we try to describe it to our clients is, you know, ultimately what you're trying to purchase is a, um, is a cash machine. You know, you don't really care whether it's got a red roof or a brown roof. You don't really care whether it's got two bedrooms or three bedrooms. All you really care about is how much money, how much return is it going to give me? Um, and, and, and that's ultimately the reason why people should be looking outside of, the, outside of London in the, in the north. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's a very good um, perspective to look at. I mean, when I started my journey back in 2011, we invested in Birmingham um, mm. and Birmingham has seen some fantastic capital growth, more capital growth than I'd expected. Um, and I think the other side is we've had Reading as well, which has seen very similar growth to London. So I think based on your individual needs, look, understand what the options are. And I think what you touched on is find people that can manage your properties, create the system so it doesn't become an emotional decision it becomes a very constructive financial decision. And like you said, you don't care whether it's a red roof, a pink roof or a yellow roof, you know, it, you know as long as it, it pays the money, uh, pays the mortgage and gives you enough cash flow to enjoy what you want to do, I think it will make a good investment. And that's so, ca cash flow, sorry, sorry to show, ca cash yeah. flow is obviously one element of it and that's very, very important. So an annual return for the, for the viewers that are, are watching this. But the other side that you want to be also looking at, of course, is the kind of expected capital growth. So no one can, you know, no one's got crystal ball. We can't, no one can predict it accurately. But we view, what we can do is use our intellect and say, well, where is there going to be a reasonable amount of capital growth? Well, guess what? The government's given us really big clues recently. You know, where are the government investing? Where, what they're trying to do right now is a lot of people will have seen over the last 10 years, and I'm sure a lot of people will be affected by this, you know, the M1 widening works have been going on. And that means that they're trying to push more of the labour and capital, so that's people and money, outside of London into the regions. And whether those regions, you call them, you know, Birmingham, whether you call them Leeds, the point is they're trying to push um, uh, the money and the people outside of London so that we can make the other regions of the country prosperous as well. At the moment, everybody knows London's very prosperous, but the rest of the regions have not been, have not experienced that same kind of um, uh, prosperousness so i think that looking at um the infrastructure developments that are going on you know just recently they're developing a train line between leeds and manchester as well you know these kind of things the infrastructure hub that was recently announced in the spring budget that's going to be in leeds these kind of things are the things that we want to be looking at as the clues to what's going to experience capital growth as well as as you discussed to show the rental uh, profit that you're going to get on an annual basis yeah so i i think that's a really good um uh, point to make is that when you are looking at your area to invest look at what the criteria is what investment is going from the government is there going to be um, any businesses moving out there are there going to be is there a demand for rental property um, can you get there easily with transport links um, what uh, you know so look at all of these develop your criteria list I get many people coming up to me and say look Tusha I, I've got this property I could buy 50,000 uh, pound property in Hull and I say to him, yeah, but what's investment going in there? Yeah. Where's the regeneration going in there? Is that really going to make investment? Fine, go outside of London, but look for the spots where the government um, and businesses are investing in, because that will then lift the, the whole values accordingly. Um, but I always make sure that the numbers stack up and then look for the capital growth second. But Abhishek, you're, you're in a unique place in that you're funding a lot of these deals for a lot of investors. From your perspective, where are investors investing and what types of properties are they investing in? Yeah, in fact, I wanted to add on to the previous question as well. Uh, see, what, what we end up seeing as a positive, a number of portfolio landlords come to us uh, who own multiple properties, 20, 50, 100 also kind of thing. And, a lot, and they come with a particular philosophy. So they would either be looking at regions that they know well and therefore they know they will these will let well, the properties will let well, the properties will sell well when they need to, or they, they work with a particular approach. So, so we see a number of people who come in, who, who buy a house, convert it into three units, and then rent it out. 
or convert it into an HMO. And then, so, so it is about your specialization and your comfort level. So the point that you were making about Hull, I think that's a very well made point. And uh, even what Shiv, Shiv is doing, he's providing that expertise. So, so if somebody is getting that expertise, that's fine. Uh, otherwise, I would still say that it, it might be better to do something that you know, which will give you less returns, rather than j just hear somebody else's advice that, okay, Newcastle will give you 10% return, so run there and invest in Newcastle. And then it's, it becomes a situation that you can't manage. Uh, we we have been seeing uh, in in terms of what we have been seeing of during the last twelve months the purchase interest has gone up substantially. Previous to that we were getting a lot of free mortgage interest, but purchase transactions were not happening with respect to buy tenant. But during the the post pandemic period and with the stamp duty uh, waiver coming through, that interest seems to have come back. Uh, we are seeing landlords moving. Uh, we, or we are seeing a trend towards higher proportion of SPV properties uh, uh, and SPV borrowers coming to us. Uh, I, I think Hamza's point is very well made. It would depend on individual situations, but but in terms of trend, definitely there is, we are seeing, seeing a shift happen over there. And between London and regions, we I, I think that is fairly evenly distributed. London and Southeast would end up accounting for about 60% on an average. That, that trend very much is maintained. Fantastic. No, that's some really good insights there. And Hamza, from your perspective, looking at the clients that you have, what do you see are the key success factors that allow people to become successful buy to let investors? What do you see from your experience allow people to grow and grow a portfolio, get good returns on their investments? So from my side, from what I've seen, is basically individuals are proactive. So people that do their research have a strong interest and understanding of tax as well. So for example, like when the mortgage interest restric restriction rules came into play, we had a lot of clients coming to us, calling us, how will this impact me? Because in the end of the day, it's about cash flow. And as we all know, the old rules basically is not doing the old deduction. You can save tax of 40%, limiting it to 20%. So from a cash flow point of view, yes, from an accounting profit, you might be showing a loss, but from a cash point of view, you might actually be losing money basically. So where I've seen the investors who do really well, they take a proactive approach, they ask us the right questions and not being reactive, you know, they sell a limited company, they become builders and then they ask the question one year down the line, what do I do, save me tax? It's too late, it's too late. You have to be proactive, come to us first, sit down, tell us what you wanna do, tell us what you wanna achieve, tell us, the goals that you want to accomplish in two, five years will give you the complete understanding because tax not only about income tax or capital gains tax, it's, it's so many other factors like in inheritance tax and VAT. And sometimes just a small change can save you huge savings. So it's, it's all about being proactive. Those individuals that are proactive, from my experience, I've seen they've done, they've done quite well. And people who are not proactive, they just do a bit of Google research. Yes, Google's great, but you've got to speak to the right people because they're in the industry, they know what they're doing, they know what the current trends are, and they can save you so much time and effort. And the key thing, they can save you money as well. So just be proactive, as simple as that, really. Yeah, no, I, I think, sorry, yeah. I, I just wanted to add on to that. The, the great thing about what Hamza just said there, and, and I know we're trying to make that point, is it really depends on um, what you're trying to achieve, as you said at the very beginning. You know, if you're trying to invest um, for a sh for the short term, let's say you, I don't know, you want to buy a bigger house in two years time and you just have some money, some savings you want to invest in. It's probably not a good idea to say, let me potentially invest in a buy slip because it's a very long and cumbersome process, lots of fees and stuff involved. And then when you come to sell it, there's fees again. So, you know, for a short term investment, something like what Aria is doing, you know, you put your money in somewhere, they give you a return in a year's time or two years time, however long that, that investment might be. It may well work uh, well like that. And if you're looking for a longer term thing, and uh, there will be a lot of people that are looking for, actually, I've just got some money um, and I want to, realistically, we find one of three things. Either um, one, I want to um, create some security so that I can create freedom for myself and I'm not tied to doing my job if I don't want to. The second is um, parents, typically between 35 and 45 year olds, they typically have two kids under 10 years old and they're looking at either their parents, uh, their kids' futures 
or their kids um, uh, leaving a legacy for their children. So just making sure that the kids have that leg up in that world that they were probably also given as well. And the third is people that want to secure their retirement. And um, obviously all of these things are all kind of long-term things. And, and obviously that's what I'm saying, that people that want those longer-term things may be better off um, looking at um, a, a property rather than a short-term investment. But it's exactly as you said, we've got to start off by saying, what do you want to achieve? And as Hamza said, now go and get the advice from the right people. So you build a picture over time about how is it going to work and is it going to work correctly for me? Yeah, fantastic. And I'd yeah. add, kind of, I think, a very interesting point made there. Like, so we have a lot of uh, lenders on the platform who have both, you know, they have maybe one or two buy to let properties and they also want to mm. understand the importance of hassle free investment, you know, where everything, all the due diligence is done for, you know, done on the platform. They, they can go with very little amount, like as, as small as 500 pounds. Uh, then there is, you know, I five as well. So there's a tax benefit of it. So I think diversification is really the key here and to understand, or we also have investors who are, you know, retired. So they're looking for something that's, that's going to give them return in six months, 12 months, you know, they don't want to be tied in for the next five years or 10 years. So um, that's, that's, I think the main thing is to understand what kind of asset backed products available there and to kind of make your investment portfolio and diversify. Of course, this is not an advice, just a personal opinion. Yeah, no, I think that there, there's some, some really good points there. And it comes back to um, something that I, when I started in my journey, somebody said to us is that most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And I, I think anyone that's invested in their first buy to let or their second, you know, first few buy to lets will have made so many mistakes um, because we naturally do. It's only when, when we have these mistakes, we learn and then we grow. And then you create a model or a formula that you say, well, this works and we can move forward uh, and build on that. So I'm now going to come into this. During this discussion, we've talked about commercial property. We've talked about HMO, single lets, blocks of flats, peer-to-peer -peer lending. In your views um, to the panel, what do you feel are the, are the best investment opportunities in the marketplace right now for investors? And I'll, let, let's, let's categorize it. What do you feel is for, the, for somebody that has, is entering the buy-to-let market and has a deposit, somebody that has maybe a little bit of cash and wants to get a return, and somebody that has already an established portfolio, where do they put their funds for the next one? So um, I'm going to leave it to anyone who, who'd like to go on forward with that one. Mari, I think you'd be a good person to start with because you've got lots of options. Uh, yeah, I think uh, main thing, as I said, is making a decision, right? So first of all, you, you have to understand that your capital is risk, no matter whether you're buying a physical property or investing on a P2P platform, even if it's asset backed. So to understand that it's, it's the disposable income that you're willing to kind of risk as well, then the term of, your, term of the, the product, you know, is it a long term? Is it something that you want to own that you want to pass on to, or it's something that you you want to make sure that it's it's hassle free? I don't want to think about it. It's done. I'm going to get my return every six months, twelve months. I'm going to reinvest and the power of compounding and understanding that you know m money also just sitting there is is actually losing its value. You know, given the inflation. So if you just this year inflation, especially the kind of borrowing that that we have done as a government, it's the inflation rate is like 1.75%. It's like the highest European banks have gone into negative interest rate. So it's important that investment decisions are made based on understanding your risk appetite as an investor, knowing that the capital is at risk, and then looking at all these other aspects and then the taxation bits comes in. So being quite smart about it and like I, I would say diversification is the key. Fantastic. Okay, so diversify just, based upon where you are. Yeah. Just to move on, exactly that point is, and I think the reason I'm making this point is because I've realized from talking to a lot of people that this point is not clear enough. When we say diversify based on risk, what does that actually mean? So let's put some context around this. You have, you know, lowest risk and then highest risk. The lowest risk things, um, even when you put your money in the bank, there's still a risk that the bank's going to go bust. It's a small risk, but there's still a risk. If you put your money in um, in, in premium bonds or if you put money in government bonds, um, there's still a risk. And so you've got like um, 
under your mattress, low risk, but someone might come and rob you. So under your mattress, and then you've got, you know, cash and bonds and things like that. And then you've got this, this is like the low risk section. Then you've got the mid risk section, which I think is um, where a considerable, considerable, considerable amount of property and, um, um, and stocks and shares typically sit. And when I say a considerable amount, what I really mean is the populous stuff that sits in this section here. Um, and then you've got at the top kind of um, more complicated stuff that only people that work in the financial markets will know about, you know, CFDs, leverage trading, even Bitcoin, and that will be in that sort of um, region. So you've got all this risk level. And what you've got to understand is that wherever you put your money, if you've got, you know, £50,000 and you're going to put it somewhere, there is always a risk that, that you're not going to get £50,000 back wherever you put it. Uh, once you get comfortable with that, then you can start saying, okay, well, what is my risk appetite? How much return do I want? And how much return am I willing to take? One thing that I will mention is um, having been in a position where I have lost money in an investment. So I invested in, um, in another developer and, and unfortunately a developer you know, didn't come true on their word. Um, I know that your risk appetite is always um, over-exaggerated until you lose money. And then you go, actually, I don't know if I really want that kind of risk. So that's why people stick in this kind of popular section of kind of um, low to medium risk um, rather than moving up there. Uh, but it, it all depends. Of course, if you're slightly younger, you can potentially also take a little bit more risk because if it goes wrong, you still have a number of years to make back that money. If you're slightly older, maybe you're in a different position where you're like, well, if I lose the money, I don't have a huge amount of extra money to be able to make but years to be able to make that money back. Also, of course, as, as Arya says, in terms of diversifying, what you can do is say, well, if I have, you know, £100,000, maybe I can put, you know, um, 50 into this middle section and put, you know, 20 into this section and 25 or 30 into this section. And, and that means that you're able to um, diversify amongst all the risk categories. And I'm not saying that you should, by the way, you know, if you know that you're a low risk person, just stick with the low risk stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think worthwhile uh, understanding. Fantastic. And, and it's great that you talk about risk management because, it, you know, I, I think many people get excited. Um, they, they see lots of shiny pennies when they see property. They think, okay, I can make some quick money. And actually doing your research, having a risk averse approach, but a proactive approach is really important to make sure that you guarantee that your investment is going to give you the returns that you expect it to. So I'm going to come to, um, uh, to um, Abhishek and Hamza. Both of you are in the financial industry. Generally, you have a per perception of being the risk averse in any transactions from the banks and the accountants perspective. How do people, how, what, what tips can you give people to manage their risks to make sure that they don't um, uh, you know, lose their money? What would you say are the things that they should do? I would say the biggest piece of advice that I would give anyone is just be proactive. Just do your research first, because I find that a lot of clients, they have this idea, for example, or they might watch a TV show and get excited. This is what I want to do. I want to become a property builder, but they don't know what they're doing. They jump in first and then they ask the other questions. Okay. Do I need to do a tax term, for example, or how do I need to be tax structured? So what I always say to people, just keep it simple, do your research first talk to a tax professional, talk to a property professional, talk to a legal professional. Once you have all your understanding, you got all your pieces together, then you can start to form your puzzle. And then you can move into the direction that you want to achieve. And like we said in the beginning, what's the ultimate objective? Because what I find a lot of people jump in and they don't know where they want to go. Because in the end of the day, it's a journey. You need to know which direction you're heading. So do your research, be proactive, just pick up a telephone call. And, and the most important thing, speak to the right people because it's the right people that give you the right advice. And that's what, and that way you know to, to manage your risk because everything is a calculated risk in the end of the day. Well, you can limit yeah. that risk by doing your research first and foremost. Yeah, no, fantastic. And just very quickly add to that, that after uh, uh, Hamza has given a fairly comprehensive answer, but just keep, keep a bit of buffer as in don't, don't go all in probably, especially with respect to property because there can be unexpected surprises as in, a very good example is the people who are stuck with leasehold properties with flooding risks. And therefore, they are finding it very difficult to even refinance those kind of transactions. So, so it, it, it helps to, as you said, go in with eyes open, 
but keep keep a bit of buffer so that if there is something that is unexpected that comes about you you have a substantial equity and for potentially a good value appreciation for the future you don't want to lose all of it purely yeah. because you were not able to stump up a bit more in the short run kind of thing so yeah. that that's the only additional point no i i think there's some fantastic tips there and I, you know i i just want to share what my five golden rules um, of investing are. It's not mine, it's what I was taught um, when I started my journey. And actually I use this as a very good guide and I think you've all covered it. So just to summarize, when you're buying a property, look for property that you could either add value or you can get a slight discount. Just doing those two will make a big difference. Second thing is always look for cash flow. Make sure that you know at, at the end of the month, there's a little bit of profit there because that will build up um, and help you know, cover your costs. Um, make sure you research your area and there is real rental demand for your properties. You know, it's great that you could buy a 50,000 pound house in Hull, but if there's, if you can't rent it, it's 50,000 pounds down the bank, uh, down, down, down the toilet kind of thing. And um, so make sure you do your research. Um, make sure that you um, look at it for the long term as well. And I think that's the key thing as well. You know, if you're looking um, for a quick fix uh, or a quick profit, um, there are better ways of doing that. Uh, and um, things such as um, ARIA's uh, investment in ISIS will give you a return within one year to two years, depending on the investment. Um, but if you're looking to actually invest in bricks and mortars, look for the long term. And I know I normally say seven to 10 years is the landscape that you should be looking at. And you may change, if circumstances change, you can always review it. But seven to 10 years is what the landscape you should be looking at it. And I think the one thing that you've all talked about is have a cash buffer things will go wrong. You know, nobody predicted the pandemic, you know, and if you don't have a cash buffer, um, you know, it allows you to make a decision in a calm and collective way rather than, oh my God, my tenants not paying and I haven't got enough money to pay the mortgage. So always look at that. And it's interesting what people's idea of a cash buffer is, but I always say enough for six months worth of mortgage payments and expenses and refurbish, um, you know, five grand for refurbishments. You'll be interesting, like, if I speak to my wife, uh, she'll want a very expensive kitchen, but you can go to Howden's and get a very nice kitchen for £2,000. So, you know, it's all relative as an investor to what your personal views are. So I think there's some really great tips there for investors. Um, I'm now going to come into this. So we've talked about the risk. We've talked about the whole um, approach to um, buy to let. But one of the things that I always find, people overanalyze it. And many of us are very educated. We'll see the reports, we'll read the Times, We'll, we'll look at all of these things and we'll always, we'll always find a reason not to invest in something because we think it's going to fall or there's going to be a better opportunity. How do people overcome the psychology of not investing in, uh, develop a positive psychology to invest in property? What are the kind of mindsets that people need to have? Um, Shiv, let me start with you on that one. Yeah, um, I, um, I think there's one one little nugget that I'd like to share here, this is something that I've come to realise, no, you know, I, I formulated this myself. I think the reason why a lot of people in London and the South East have um, this idea that there's an exact right time to buy property is because people in London and South East are quite familiar with stocks and shares. And in, stock, in the stocks and shares market, you know, if you buy it yesterday or if you buy it today, you're going to get two different prices. And more importantly, that price is an exact price. So if, you, I, want, if I wanted to buy um, Virgin Media shares, for example, I'd have to buy it at the exact price that it is at the moment that I buy it. With property, it's actually very, very different. Well, certainly, with um, you know, um, if you're buying a buy to let property, you could have two houses that are right next door to each other, exactly the same house, exactly the same color, exactly the same condition. But this one sells for a hundred thousand, and this one sells for a hundred and twenty thousand. So, what's the difference there? So, I think it's all about go back to your golden rules to show. It's all about trying to understand that market, do that negotiation, and and make it work for you. But realize that actually, with property, because it is a long term game. It's more about getting in the market sooner than it is about trying to time the exact perfect time to buy it. You know, if you get in the market at some point this year, it's better than trying to say, well, is it going to be really better if I buy it in March or if I buy it in, in June or April? Like, it's probably going to be virtually similar. Like, it's not going to be that much different. But ultimately, buying it is going to, and, and especially if you have that long-term mindset of keeping it, is going to help you get over that fear of, oh, is this the right time to get in? Fantastic. Abhishek, what's your thoughts on the psychology of property investing? I think it, it is a matter of confidence. People who get in once gradually 
are able to develop that confidence that once they have the, gone through the cycle, invested in something, added value to it, either rented it out or sold it and get, got some equity out, they are able to turn it around again and again. And then that, that gives them the confidence. So probably best to start small. If, if somebody is looking to get, get in there, I, I, at least if I have to do, that's what I would do. That start small, start with something that I'm comfortable with where I can control the variables. And, and then if that works successfully, then repeat that over and over again. Fantastic, Abhishek. And Arya, what about yourself? Um, I think this, this concept of, you know, getting on the property ladder is seen, like, especially for younger generation, like, so difficult. And, you know, even like, uh, even with the 5% deposit that has, that's come down, that still can be quite difficult for a lot of people. You know, the average deposit in London is 85,000 pounds. So I think it's important uh, to understand that the other products in the market, such as, you know, our, our product, that the barrier to entry in property bricks and mortar is has been taken away completely right like uh, 500 pound for example is a minimum investment on the platform and you can still get the double up to 10 percent gross interest per annum um so it, it's it's is that notion that i need to have a lot of capital to invest in property i think that's the psychology that's where the awareness and the education needs to come in and that, that that's also where people needs to uh, understand there are other products which are still asset backed and you can start with as little as you know 500 pound for example of course um, uh, investment is at risk but making sure that you are also doing due diligence so for example like you know we only do first charge loans loan to value are capped at like 70% during pandemic we we brought it down to 65% and being a fintech platform we are agile to kind of change our lending criteria so making sure that even the platform that you choose to invest in uh, still you have to do your due diligence and understand that you know it's a, it's a disposable income that you're playing with but yes the main psychology is to take away that barrier that you actually don't need to have a lot of capital to invest in property there are other products uh, that's now available because of you know uh, in invent of technology and financial services fantastic thank you uh, and i think that's a really good point that you don't need a lot of capital to get exposure to the property market the mm -hmm. the the barriers to entry have really now been removed and there are lots of opportunities of getting exposure to the property market. Hamza, what would you say is your tip on psychology? I would say in terms of the psychology barrier, in terms of we've got a lot of clients that normally when they get into property and they ask for advice, yes, they do their book research, the Google research, but then there's also real life experience as well. So we tell clients, okay, yes, they want to buy a buy-to-let. They have magnificent ideas. They want to buy four. They want to buy five with no previous experience. So we say start small, do your basic book research, you know, speak to relevant people. But then you have to get the real life, re you know, experience as well. For example, you might have family. You might think I'm going to achieve this goal in one year. Actually, it takes five. You know, then it comes real life finance. As your real life knowledge kind of builds up, then you can take more and more calculated decisions. And then you realize actually it takes me a year or five. So it comes back again to tax. You know, they don't know the type of items they can claim. What can they not claim? Oh, I should have structured like this. And after three, four years of doing it, five years, they come to us and they got this structure already in their mind. And we're saying, yeah, that's fantastic. That's exactly the way to go because they got that real life knowledge now. So as you get that practical experience, we become more confident. And then they know exactly what, what to do, basically. So that's that's probably the top tip I would give. Fantastic. So look, we, we've had a fantastic conversation. I think we could be carrying on for the next uh, two hours talking about property. We have, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, I'm now going to conclude it. So what I'd like you to do is just to share any one point or golden nugget that you feel or a, a, something that you think will help the, the viewers and also if they want to find out more information about how they can um, access uh, your services, your expertise, how they can get in touch with you. So I'll start with Arya. Um, first of all, like great conversation. It's great to get different perspective. I think we all agree that diversification is the key and knowing what is your risk appetite uh, and where to start depending on you know, long-term investment and so on. Um, my, I would say like there's this amazing book that I read quite early on in my life. It's called Psychology of Money. So it's it's about it's like how you look at money. 
you know, so it's not per se about investment in general, but how you look at money, how you look at your finances and like the power of compounding is so strong. So earlier you start, even if it's like one 10 pound, it doesn't matter. It's investment is all about, you know, compounding over time and being consistent. So that's like one book I would really recommend. And when it comes to like our platform, which is, you know, asset back 10% gross interest, minimum investment starts small, you can find all about that on our platform, www.futurebricks.com. Everything is transparent. You can look at the projects, uh, uh, which area locations, LTV and so on. Uh, so that that's very easy to get on and you can download our app as well, which is on Apple Store or Android. Fantastic. Thanks, Arya. Shiv? Um, I think that, um, as I said at the beginning, a, a lot of people um, like the idea of um, ownership. And if um, that is something that you want for the long term, I th the, the, the advice or the guidance that I would say is, you know, start, start sooner rather than later. The, the great uh, saying says, start and get perfect later. You know, there are going to be, as Hamza said, there are going to be revelations along the way. There's going to be mistakes that you make. You cannot be perfect on the first one that you buy. But the first one that you buy, by the time you get to 20 years from now, is going to hopefully be worth a lot more than what you bought it for. So you're going to be, um, if you keep it for, for, for long enough, you're going to make a profit on it. You don't need to necessarily be um, make sure that it's the perfect one, but get involved and get, get into the market, I think is the uh, idea. And in terms of getting in touch with us, I think it's www.lifestylepropertypeople.co.uk, www.lifestylepropertypeople.co.uk. And you can also follow me on uh, Instagram and Facebook, Shiv Haria, S-H-I-V, and that surname is H-A-R-I-A. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Abhishek? So uh, while, while we obviously don't do investments directly, but once you have identified your investments, we, we would be happy to try and support that, uh, whether it is a residential buy-to-let property or a commercial buy-to-let property. We, we fund both kind of situations and are actively looking to grow on, the, on that space. Uh, you can reach out to us through any of our branches in UK. I, I believe this segment is largely targeted also towards the community in India. So I just wanted to, to add a small plug about that, that we are coming out very shortly with a buy-to-let product focused on Indian investors who are looking to buy buy-to-let properties in the UK. So that uh, 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 that should be coming out in the next few weeks. So uh, pl please do reach out to our branches if there is anything at all that we can do for you. Fantastic. Hamza. Yeah, the biggest piece of advice I would give to people is just be proactive because you, your journey has to stop from somewhere. Do your research in the beginning, know all the factors that are, that are involved basically and speak to the right people basically because when you start, it's not only going to be one day or one year, it's going to be a, a long-term objective. And the second thing is communication. And when I mean communication, it can just be a simple two-minute conversation. I've had a simple two-minute conversation where someone told me about their idea and the whole tax structure had to change. So we always recommend clients, before you do anything, always communicate, even by text, by email, telephone call, anything, because now these days it's so easy to communicate to anyone. So... You can just contact me, Hamza at fergusonmainman.co.uk or just visit our website, www.fergusonmainman.co.uk. And it's all about communication because things that work today won't work in 10 years or 20 years. Everything keeps changing, evolving. New products are coming out. People are more risk averse so it's, or more risky. It's all about communication. So that's, that's the top tip I'll give. Fantastic. Thanks. Look, we, we, we could be here for a couple of hours still, um, but it's been a fantastic conversation some fantastic golden nuggets. And um, is buy to let dead? In my view, no. I think it provides a fantastic opportunity. If you have the open mindset, you do your research, start small and take consistent act action in a proactive step. And I recall a conversation when I brought my first buy to let, the landlord said to me, he goes, back in 1989, interest rates were around 15%. He goes, Tusha, be careful about interest rates. Since I've started, I've only seen interest rates go down. So I think, you know, you have to look at it in today's world, what the current markets are showing and opportunities presented to yourself. And the panel today are people that you can contact to get advice, explore options, and really work with them to make sure your property investment journey is as successful as it should be. 
thank you very much, everybody. It's been a fantastic discussion. Um, and please do contact us if you need any further information. Thank you very much. Thank you.